So when people say, oh, I'm in receipt of a benefit, sometimes they don't know which type of benefit they're in receipt of. And that can make a huge difference. Thanks very much for inviting me here today. I'm going to be talking for the next hour or so about benefits, so we need to lock the doors because it's not the most happiest of topics and it can be quite complex. So please do, if you have any questions at the end, please ask me. But what I've tried to do is make this as simple as I possibly can um, <clears throat> rather than going into the complexity of some benefits. So we're going to have an overview of the benefit system today and we're going to be looking at what benefits are, who administers benefits because there's lots of different departments, some main benefits I'll be chatting about and looking at a benefit journey because since I started in the world of benefits the, the claiming process and the journey for benefit claimants has changed quite drastically and there's been a move now towards online claims for benefits which I'm sure many people have seen in the papers especially around universal credit so there's quite a change there. I'm also going to look at in depth at personal independence payment which is a headline benefit and it's relatively new it came out in 2013 so in the benefits world that's quite relatively new and we're still quite excited by personal independence payment because it changes as the law changes so I'll be going into those quite the uh, personal independence payment and then we will have questions at the end um, and of course when there's a break you can come and ask me questions I'll be mostly around the food and drink area so please come and see me uh, any questions at all if you think of a question later on I'll leave my email address and, and my mobile with Karen do drop me a line I'm happy to answer those questions absolutely so let's get started so what are benefits? It's a, a simple question, um, but benefits are payments that the government makes to certain uh, groups of individuals, people who are on low income, and also to uh, assist people who have specific needs. Okay. There's a number of benefits out there which I'm sure you've read about or heard about, Job Seekers Allowance, Employment and Support Allowance, if you're ill looking for work, Personal Independence Payment, Disability Living Allowance, the list goes on, Industrial Injuries, a particular favourite of mine, it's a, an underused benefit and I'll come to that later on. But benefits are, uh, can be broken down into three types. So this may be news to you because when people say, oh, I'm in receipt of a benefit, sometimes they don't know which type of benefit they're in receipt of. And that can make a huge difference. So there's what we call contribution-based benefits. And they're based on your national insurance stamp that you've either paid or have been credited in the last two, three years. I'll give you an example. Today, if I was to claim job seekers allowance because I'm looking for a job and I've worked in the last three years and paid the right amount of national insurance, I will receive my job seeker allowance, allowance payment of £73.10p because that's how much job seekers allowance is per week. I will receive that payment whilst looking for work. Now, I'll only get that for six months, mind. So that's contribution-based. My husband's income, or indeed any savings or capital I have, does not impact on my £73.10 a week. The government will ignore that because it's paid on my Nash insurance. So that's important to know. 
We also have, and I'm going to jump to means-tested benefit. And what means-tested benefit is, is based on your income, your savings, your capital. Okay? It's not based on your contributions. So today, if I claim Job Seekers Allowance looking for work, and I hadn't paid the right amount of national insurance contributions in the last three years, the government will say to me, well, we're going to pay you means-tested job seekers allowance. So we're going to look at your husband's income. And if you've got enough to live on, we're not going to pay you any job seekers. I will get £73.10 a week. And that's important because I see lots of clients who come to me and confused. They're in receipt of job seekers allowance, but they're not getting any money. That's because they're not in receipt of contributions-based benefit and they may have a partner, they may have savings and that has a direct impact on their payment of £73.10 a week. So I'll still have to look for work but the only thing I will receive is a national insurance stamp for my state pension when I retire when I'm 68 which is something to look forward to. So that's the difference, contribution-based and means-tested benefit, very, very different. The new benefit now that's come out, universal credit, you can see there, that's means-tested benefit, okay? Any, uh, any benefit that you receive, it's important to check your letter and make sure uh, to see if it's contribution-based or income-related. And sometimes, when you apply for benefits and you get turned down, sometimes they'll make a mistake and they'll say you haven't paid enough contributions so we can't pay you contributions benefit. So always worth checking that, a little tip there. It's worth checking, you can go online and everyone here can um, check their national insurance contributions online. It's very simple, it's very straightforward. It's really good to check, okay? The DWP, who I'll come on into a moment, who administer benefits, don't always get it right. So it's worth checking. Then in the middle, we've got what's called non-contributory benefits. And they're benefits where it doesn't matter if you've worked, doesn't matter if you've got national insurance stamp or not, doesn't matter if you've got savings or capital. Absolutely uh, no effect. These benefits are paid for the extra costs associated with certain things including disabilities. So for example, personal independence payment, disability living allowance, absolutely not means tested. You could be a millionaire and in receipt of personal independence payment. Makes absolutely no difference. So they're the three types of benefits there. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to go in and out of this PowerPoint because I hope to to uh, enable you to have some sources of information uh, to be able to rely on good sources of information and I've chosen Turn to Us which is a, a charity that works with people on low income to look at whether they would be entitled to benefits or grants because at the moment believe it or not there's 20 billion pounds worth of tax credits and benefits unclaimed every year. Every year, 20 billion is sat there waiting to be claimed. So it's really worth knowing about organisations such as Turn To Us who will be able to carry out benefit checks and look for other support and help. So what I'm going to do, hopefully, is come out of here and go onto the Turn To Us website. So what we'll do, if we bear with, Thank you. Can everybody see that? Turn to us. Has anybody heard of Turn to Us at all? This is new. It's a great charity. I'll just pop to their home page so you can see them. You can see their banner headline. They are a charity. Okay. So they're a national charity helping people when times get tough, providing financial support to people. Uh, to get back on track and they also have a helpline that helpline there is for people who cannot access the internet uh, but they've got an online benefit calculator and they've also got a grant search tool on their website it's a, it's a fantastic source of information there 
So I'm going to go down because they've got a great section on benefits. If I click on your situation and I go to the A to Z of benefits, they've got every benefit there listed, A to Z. Lovely. And I'm going to go to I, and that's industrial injuries I'm going to go to for you. Anybody heard of industrial injuries benefit? It's a little known benefit, but it's a really good benefit to know about. Okay. There we go. Industrial injuries, disablement benefit. And industrial injuries is for people who are disabled because of an accident or of certain diseases caused by work. And um, it's paid by the Department of Work and Pensions. So Turn to Us has a great section on benefits. What is, what is a benefit? Can I get it? How much is it? How do I claim it? How do I challenge it? So if you're thinking or you need some information around benefits, you won't go far wrong with Turn to Us as a starting point. They're A to Z of benefits. Okay. Go back into my PowerPoint. There we go. So there are your three types of <coughs> benefits there. Was that news to you that there's, there's those layers of benefits within the benefit system? Really important when you do claim benefits, read your letter from the DWP, who administers mostly benefits. Read always your benefit letter. You don't want to miss out. Okay. So who administers benefits? Well, generally, as I've mentioned, it's the Department for Work and Pensions, which is a huge organisation. And when you contact the Department of Work and Pensions, they have a number of departments. I've listed a couple there. We've got the Job Centre Plus. You may see job centres round and about where you live. You'll have a Job Centre Plus. They're changing job centres at the moment. They used to be quite hostile places, I would say, when going into a job centre plus. You'd have the security guards stood there asking you, who, what are you doing here? Who do you want to see? Have you got an appointment? Quite a hostile environment. However, they're changing. And now when you go into the job centre plus, the last job centre I went into, I was greeted by somebody smiling. How can I help you? So they're changing their environment. And the reason why they're changing their environment is because of universal credit. Universal credit is a new benefit. Anybody heard of universal credit? Lovely. Yes, it's in the papers a lot. Yes. It's a new benefit. And that means people claiming universal credit will be going into job centres. Okay? So they're changing their approach. So we've got the Department of Work and Pensions that manage job centre pluses. They also manage the disability departments that deal with personal independence payment, attendance allowance, carers allowance. Another tip, when you receive or if you receive a letter from any department of the DWP, make sure you keep it. Keep it in a file, keep it because on that letter will be their telephone number. Different departments in the DWP sometimes have different telephone numbers and there's nothing worse than googling a telephone number and going round the houses. So keep that letter, one for the telephone number, but also for documentary evidence if it's ever needed down the line. So get a nice box and pop it in the box. DWP also manage the pension service they're quite nice to talk to when you, when you call the pension service. I don't know whether it's a nice working environment there, but they're always quite pleasant. And the other department that works, it doesn't come under the Department of Work and Pensions, is the Inland Revenue. Now, the Inland Revenue manage child tax credit, working tax credit, and child benefit. However, at the moment, because child tax credit and working tax credit is coming under universal credit, the Inland Revenue, in the end, will send it all over child tax credit and work into the Department of Work and Pensions, who will manage it, and they will only manage then child benefit. So when you call HMRC, you could be on the line for about an hour. 
call either very early in the morning or very late because you will be on the line for an hour. They're pushing everything to online. They've got the HMRC gateway. Don't know if anybody's used a gateway account. Yeah, they're good. They're quick, they're efficient to use. Calling HMRC can be a real nightmare. It really can. It'll say on their website, these are our busiest times. And lastly, the local authority also manage benefits. They manage housing benefits and council tax reductions predominantly. Housing benefit, again, is coming under universal credit and will go over to the Department of Work and Pensions, but they will still manage council tax reduction. So there's a number of departments, a number of organisations that manage benefits. It's not just one, I'm afraid. When it comes to what benefit to claim, it sometimes can be really complex and difficult to understand. Will I, do I meet the eligibility rules? Will I meet the criteria? Is this the right benefit for me? What I would say is there's lots of information sources, and I'm going to uh, show you one now from the citizen's advice, that clearly sets out the eligibility rules clearly sets out then the criteria for that benefit that you can look at and think about. But if you ever think, well, should I be claiming this benefit or not? Go to your local advice centre. Ask to speak to one of the welfare benefits team. They'll be able to then work through the criteria with you because it's not always simple and straightforward. If it is simple and straightforward for you, fine. But if it's not, don't be afraid to go to an advice centre and ask, would I be eligible for this benefit? That's what they've got their trained advisors to do, is to do absolutely that. So once you've determined, yes, I'm going to make a claim for this benefit, how do you claim? Well, a lot of benefits now are going towards online, predominantly universal credit. Okay. If you have to make a claim for universal credit and you phone up the universal credit helpline, the first thing they'll say to you is, can you make the claim online? They're pushing people to make claims online. And that's absolutely fine if you're able to make a claim and manage that claim online. Because once you've made a claim online, you've got to manage it online. In and out, in and out, having a look at your claim. Okay. So if you're confident to do that, that's absolutely fine. What they don't say when you phone up is that there are exceptional circumstances where they'll allow you to make a claim over the telephone. So never be afraid to ask, can I make a claim over the telephone rather than online? Because so many claims are going online now, there will always be circumstances where they'll allow you to make a claim over the telephone. So ask. And it will also be clear in the information sources I show you now whether in fact you can make that claim online. If you make a telephone claim, generally the council use telephone claims, although a lot of councils now for housing benefit or council tax reduction, they'll start the claim online. Okay, They're pushing towards online as well. And there's also paper claims where you can phone up and say, I'd like to make a claim, can you send me a claim form to start the claim? Okay, we call them paper claims or clerical claims. So there's a number of ways in which you can claim. Once you receive, or once you've made your claim, generally you receive a form. Okay, nice big form will land on your, on your doormat. The personal independence form is 50 pages long. It's a huge form, okay? And when you receive the form, do not throw out the guidance notes. Because with every form, whatever benefit it is, you will receive guidance notes. And the amount of clients that come to me and bring me their form and I say, where's your guidance notes? They're in the bin. They're in the recycling bin. Don't throw them out, read them. They're there 
to do exactly that, guide you through the form, and they're really helpful. They may be from the DWP or the local authority, but they are very helpful to use, especially if you're going to do the form yourself, read the guidance notes. If you think, actually, no, I don't want to do the form myself, I need a little bit of support here, there's lots of tools online to help you with that, and I'm going to show you some fantastic tools to help you complete that form online yourself. Or you can contact your local advice bureau and they will have, hopefully, form fillers who can help you complete that form. Okay. Because that form is your starting point for claiming benefits. And it's really important you get it right, or as right as you possibly can. What you want to do is throw the kitchen sink at it. Okay. It's to answer those questions with as much detail as you possibly can. So once you've done your form and sent it off, if you're claiming a disability benefit, you will have a medical assessment. Okay? Medical assessments associated with PIP. A lot of my clients you know, will give me bad feedback on what's happened at their medical assessment. It hasn't been a good experience for them. But what I would say and um, what's really important is to prepare for any medical assessment. And again, there's some great, great online information sources around preparing for your medical assessment. Gathering any medical evidence. Gathering medical evidence from specialist nurses. Gathering any reports, your list of medication being prepared for the types of questions that they're going to ask you. Knowing where the location is, have they got access? Is it easy access? Is there parking? You know, there's nothing worse than trying to get to a location, you're worried, you're sweating, am I going to get there on time? Is there parking? Eliminate all that stress. Think about it. If you're going somewhere for a medical assessment, do you know the location? Do you know where it is? Can you park? Is there coffee facilities? Is there water facilities? It's all very important to know this. So there's lots of great information sources on preparing for your medical assessment. And lots of people ask me about recording their PIP, especially their PIP medical assessments. You can record your PIP medical assessment. You do need uh, recording device that will record, uh, make two copies because you have to hand over a copy at the end of that assessment. Now you could use two tape recorders. There's tape recorders in Argos, they're 15 99 each and the tapes are 5 99 and the batteries. It's a lot of money to lay out in one go. Could get it cheaper on eBay but it used to be a lot more expensive. It's come down slightly because you just need two recording devices so that you hand over a copy of that recording before you leave. That's the, the requirement. So it's worth thinking about, should I record my medical assessment? So, can you use an iPhone to record it? No, you, unfortunately you can't. No, no absolutely no. No, sorry. For more guidance on that, when you receive your letter uh, inviting you to a medical assessment, if it's Capita or ATOS, you can go to their website and they list then uh, lots of questions around and answers around your medical assessment. What will happen? Can I record it? What equipment will I use to record it? There's lots of information there for you. Preparation is really key to your medical assessment. Once you've been for the medical assessment, that medical assessor will send their report over to the, what we call the decision maker in the DWP. And the decision maker makes the decision. Should this person receive benefit or shouldn't they? Okay, and what level? They will send a letter out saying, yes, we've awarded benefit, or no, we haven't awarded benefit, okay? If benefit has been awarded, check it. Make sure it's the right level for you. Make sure uh, it's what you were expecting. If the benefit hasn't been awarded, you can challenge that decision. And that's called a mandatory reconsideration. 
and that's the first hurdle towards appealing. Used to be many moons ago that you could go straight to appeal, but now that we've got an extra hurdle. So you can submit what's called a mandatory reconsideration. And that's a person saying, hang on a minute, I don't agree with the decision of the DWP. I want you to look at it again, please, DWP. That decision maker got it all wrong. So you send your mandatory reconsideration, you see very straightforward, your name, address, date of birth, national insurance number, and the reason why you disagree. And this is key, because I speak to decision makers, and what they say is we need to know the reason why within the context of that benefit. So there's no point writing a letter to the DWCP saying, I disagree because the healthcare professional didn't listen to me. That's irrelevant to the decision maker. They want to know, for example, with PIP, I disagree with the decision because I do have difficulty in preparing and cooking a meal because my arthritis means I have pain and my grip is very limited. It's very, very focused in on the criteria of that benefit. So it's really important to have that in your mandatory reconsideration letter. Another tip, whenever you send a letter to the Department for Work and Pensions, take a copy. Take a copy on your phone. As long as you've got a copy and you send it recorded delivery. Always have proof that you've sent it. Okay. It's either recorded or registered as long as you've got proof there. But things do go missing in the DWP and it's always, always important to have that uh, copy and proof of postage. Now, when the decision maker in the DWP receives your mandatory reconsideration, they put their teacup down, stop drinking their tea, and they get your file out. And they say, right, let's see if this decision is right or not. And they'll look at all the information used to make the decision. If they think it's wrong, and of late, of late, my experience has been that slowly, they have been making changes to decisions very slowly, but there has been a slight shift, which is good, which is very good news. If they think it's wrong, they'll change it and say, sorry, we got this wrong. Actually, you are entitled to benefit. Here we are. And they'll send a new letter out. If they think the initial decision is right, they'll say, nope, nope, the decision is stands and you're not entitled to benefit and they'll send another letter out. What's key with any mandatory reconsideration is that you get that in within one month of your decision letter. Okay, strict time limits with these. When you receive your, what we call a mandatory reconsideration decision notice, and that's why I've said I've locked the doors to keep you all here, because it can't quite get wordy. A mandatory reconsideration decision notice when you receive that, if the DWP say, no, we're not changing the decision, you can go to appeal. Now, an appeal is someone saying, I disagree with the DWP, and I want an independent person to decide. Are they right or am I, or am I right? Okay, that's an appeal. And it's a magistrate's court and tribunal service who deal with the appeals. When you make an appeal, you can make it online, which is a new thing, and I'm going to show you that now. It's very quick, it's very easy to make that online. Okay. Sorry, Marcus, thank you. You can also make it on paper, but online is a new thing for the tribunal service. Once they receive your uh, appeal, they'll send you an acknowledgement saying, got your appeal, and what we've done is we're going to ask the DWP to provide all the evidence they use to make this decision. Okay? And thank you, Marcus, I'll show you that. So you've got, there we go. We've got the government website there, submit your personal independent appeal online. So we're testing an online service for people to submit their PIP appeals online. 
apps, really good service, pop it online. Why not? If you're able to, there's always the option of a paper, uh, and a paper appeal, and they're called SSCS ones, okay? And they should be there to say, if you can't do it online, then you can always do it on paper. Okay, so it's worth having a look. And as I say, when you've sent your SSCS one, or you've done your appeal online, the DWP, sorry, the Tribunal Service will acknowledge that and ask the DWP to send all the information they use to make the decision. And you will receive what's called a schedule of evidence, which is this thick. It just arrives in a big brown envelope about eight weeks later. This is a long process. Eight weeks later, you'll receive a schedule of evidence. If you've got an advice centre near you, take your schedule of evidence to them. Let a welfare benefits advisor look at your schedule of evidence because there'll be lots of information in there that you need to go through. If you've got a representative, and it's great to hear that you've got the support of the specialist nurses who are able to go to tribunal with you, fantastic. That's fantastic support. If you've got a representative, then they can look at the schedule of evidence. You can have an appeal where you're not there, i.e. you don't go and sit in front of the panel. I wouldn't recommend that unless you've got substantial medical evidence to support. I always advise my clients, go to an appeal. If it was horrific, I would say don't go, it's horrific, because I don't want to put anybody through uh, that type of experience. But by and large, the feedback is they're not too bad, because the overriding objective of the tribunal service is to deal with cases fairly and justly. And what that means is to, is to discard formality if they can. When you go to an appeal for PIP, it's only three people in front of you, usually at a desk. You've got the social security chair, who's usually a practicing or non-practicing barrister or solicitor. You've got a medical professional and you've got a care professional. And they'll say, come in, sit down, I want to ask you some questions. Don't be afraid of going to an appeal. Don't be afraid at all. And again, there's lots of, uh, lots of tools that you can use to actually prepare yourself for an appeal. You will every now and then come across an appeal panel who are a bit hoity-toity. You know, but that's life, isn't it? And what's important is to know that you can complain about them or you can take your appeal higher. So there's always a solution to that. Don't take it personal. They're probably like it to everybody. You know, don't let that put you off because sometimes you'll see on forums, and I do, horror stories of people going to appeal and it hasn't been a good experience for them. And that's wrong. And that's why there's the complaint service there. Okay. So, just pop back in there. Okay. So, hopefully, when you go to an appeal, it's successful. Because the appeal panel will look at all the evidence in the DWP schedule of evidence, but more importantly, they'll ask you questions. They'll ask the appellant questions about, about that particular benefit. For example, with industrial injuries benefit, if I'm claiming industrial injuries benefit and I've got carpal tunnel syndrome, they're going to ask me questions about my ability to grip by my, ability, my pain levels, etc. And they will have knowledge of that benefit because they'd, they'd be doing that job day in, day out. So they should have expert knowledge about that benefit and know what they're talking about. Okay. If your appeal is successful, brilliant. Your benefit will be backdated to the date that you claimed it, all the way back, not from the date of the appeal. Okay. If your appeal is not successful, you can appeal higher. You can appeal to the next tribunal, but only on a point of law. And that's when you need specialist advice. So that's the journey of uh, a benefit claimant all the way to appeal. Has anybody got any questions at this point? Yeah. No? Okay, lovely. So what I'm going to move on now is to PIP. 
personal independence payment. As I said, it's a relatively new benefit, 2013, April 2013. And it's a disability benefit, okay, and it's paid not for the conditions that you have, but how your conditions affect you, okay, within the context of what we call descriptors or activities, okay. It's not a means-tested benefit, so as I said, you can have capital, you can have income, it's not going to affect your payment of PIP. Okay. PIP is there for the extra costs associated with your disability. For example, if you need to have your heating up higher, if you need a taxi to get places, if you need special food, that's what personal independence payment is for, is that extra cost of disabilities. And PIP is split into two components. Okay. You've got daily living and mobility. Um, PIP is based on points. It's a points-based system. Eight points is the standard rate. Twelve points is an enhanced rate. Okay. If you don't meet the threshold of eight points, no PIP, even if it's seven. It's got to get to eight. And it's, as I said, it's split into two. It's split into daily living, which is all about self-care. Okay, washing, dressing, eating, cooking, okay, no cleaning, no, no, nothing like that. It's very much around self-care. And then you've got the mobility element. You've got the ability to walk. They look at your ability to walk and also your ability to go outside to places. PIP doesn't just look at physical disabilities, it looks at mental health disabilities as well. Okay, so it's both. And as I say, with PIP, there's what we call descriptors. And we're going to look at these descriptors now. Thank you, Marcus. And I'm going to show you a fantastic tool uh, on Turn to Us, which you can use to determine whether you think you would meet the criteria or not for PIP. Okay, that's lovely. Thank you. So these are the PIP descriptors, and you'll see attached to every descriptor is points. So for example, preparing food on the daily living. If I need an aid or appliance to be able to prepare or cook a simple meal, I'll get two points. There's lots of discussion around what an aid or appliance is, uh, but generally if you're looking at uh, the grippers, if you've got arthritis in your hands and you need a gripper for gripping to open tins, okay, if you've got perching stools, that's possibly an aid. So any aid that you're using, pots and pans, different pots and pans, lightweight ones, any aids that you use, two points. Okay, there we are, I've started two points. And then I move on, taking nutrition. Okay. If I need an aid to take nutrition, again, two points. So I've already got up to four points. That's how it works. So if you look at each activity, and if you think that applies, then you add the points up as you go. So if I get eight points on daily living and eight points on mobility, that will give me standard rate for both. So I'll just go through the descriptors with you. So we've got washing and bathing, managing toilet needs, dressing and undressing, communicating, reading and understanding, engaging with people face to face, budgeting, and then we come on to mobility. So we've got planning and following journeys, being able to plan and follow journeys due to psychological distress. And then we've got actually moving around and the, the uh, points there for moving around and being able to walk. walk. It's really important that pe when people look at this that they know how far 20 metres is. The amount of clients that I've seen and I said, you know how far 20 metres is? They may have claimed 20 metres on their form, but they don't know actually how far 20 metres is. If you don't know how far it is, have a look, work it out. 
half the length of a rugby pitch is 50 metres, same for football. So that, they are the PIP descriptors. That's all the DWP is interested in with PIP. They're not interested in anything else, only these descriptors. So focus in on the descriptors. But there's a fantastic tool on Turn to Us under Can I Get PIP? If I pop down here, you'll see. There we go. You can get an idea of whether you qualify for PIP on the CAP website. It's really great. We've got Need Help Applying for PIP or ESA. And I'm going to go for Help Preparing for PIP. Click on that and you'll see then. Take a look at some of the questions. Okay. And there we go. They've got all the questions. There are all the descriptors there. What do you have trouble with? And if I click on Managing Treatment, and it'll ask me, do you take any prescribed medication? Yes, I do. And then I'm going to try another. Do you have any therapeutic treatment? No, I don't. Try another. Do you manage your medication without AIDS? No. And if I click on your assessment, it'll tell me there, from the questions you've answered so far, you'll not, you not have enough points, because I've only answered one question. If you go through all the questions, it'll tell you at the end how many points it's added up. It's a fantastic tool, really, really great tool. And it'll also prompt you as well to say, don't forget to tell the medical assessor about the problems that you're having with taking medication. It's a good prompt. That again comes back to preparing for your medical assessment. So with PIP, you give them a telephone call. I'll come back in a minute to the Citizens Advice website that has the telephone number to make a claim. It's really important that you use the right telephone number. You phone up, they'll take your name, address, national insurance number, and there's a list of things that they'll ask you. Then they'll send out the form to you. It takes about 14 days. It's about 50 pages long. It's very daunting. First few pages is admin, really. You know, doctor's details and your prescription list. The nitty-gritty comes to those questions around washing, dressing, eating, preparing food. They've got a great guide with the PIP form. It's a really good guide, really worth reading that guide because it'll give you an explanation of what those questions mean. And that's important to know. Because when they say, can you prepare and cook? Can you prepare and cook a meal? They don't mean a meal for the family. They mean a meal for one. So it's not a three course dinner. It's a simple meal for one. And that information is in your booklet. The questions are not as straightforward as we think they are. So it's important to read that uh, guidance. And again, with PIP, you'll go for your medical assessment, okay, Capita or Atos. Prepare for your medical assessment. And I'm going to show you in a moment the citizens' advice how to prepare for your medical assessment. Okay. There we go. So if you go on to the citizens' advice, website they've got an advice guide and I'm going to go to England okay they've got a great section on benefits there you'll see A to Z of benefits has anybody used this website it's really worth having a look it's good information it's correct information got an A to Z of benefits there all the benefits listed okay so I'm going to then Go for PIP, personal independence payment. Go, there we go. And it will give you information on PIP. Check if you're eligible to claim. How much can you get? Okay, extra money. Because when, if you make a claim for PIP and receive PIP, sometimes, depending on your circumstances, you can receive what we call premiums. Sometimes, okay. So that's why that's there. Moving from DLA to PIP, because as we know, disability living allowance is now being phased out, okay? And PIP 
is the new disability benefit. People have started to receive their letters say, inviting them. It's not an invitation, it's a fait accompli. You must, otherwise your DLA will stop. Inviting them to make a claim for PIP, okay, because DLA is being phased out at the moment. At some point there will be no DLA, it'll be all PIP. So there's lots of information there, moving from disability living allowance to PIP. And we've got how to claim PIP, help to claim the evidence to support your PIP claim. I cannot stress enough, if you've got any evidence, please do send it with your PIP claim. When you've completed your form, take a copy, take a copy of your evidence, send your PIP form back, recorded or registered delivery. Okay. Evidence is really important. Preparing for your PIP assessment. Give some great handy tips there on preparing for your PIP assessment. Okay. Including keeping a diary. Because with PIP, if you've got a condition that can vary, okay, it's difficult sometimes. And I've heard so many clients say to me, well, on my good day, well, hang on a minute, what, what's a good day for you is not necessarily going to be a good day for somebody without your condition. And the amount of clients' report, medical reports that I've seen where the healthcare professional said, on their good day, this person can do X, Y, and Z because they've taken it the wrong way. I always try to avoid the word a good day. Unfortunately, this claim process is not the most positive, it's, it is negative. But if you can avoid using a good day on a day when I'm in less pain, on a day when I can climb those stairs, really important that if you do have a fluctuating condition that you try to keep a diary and not a, you know an in-depth diary it doesn't have to be Samuel Pepys but a few words each day are you, having a, are you having a day where you can do something without pain or less pain okay and if you keep that diary for a month you will be able to gauge then whether you meet that criteria because your condition's got to affect you for the majority of the time, i.e. over 50%. Okay, and fluctuating conditions for healthcare professionals and PIP, they find that difficult to understand a fluctuating condition. They like a flat line, you're always in pain, that's better. Not a fluctuating condition, it confuses them. So keep a diary. On there also, the citizens advice, you've got a help sheet for the day of your assessment. Okay, do it, have a look at it. If you don't need it, fine, but it's worth having a look at it. If I go back now. Okay, and then we've got lots and lots of information around challenging decisions and um, couple of templates there as well. You've got also the same on the Turn To Us website, okay? They've got a great section on challenging and complaints as well, okay? If you're not happy about something, about the healthcare professional's conduct, then make a complaint. It's not going to prejudice your claim. They want to know. It says on the Capita website and it says on the ATOS website, we want to know. We want to know if it's not going right, because we've got to put it right. And that's absolutely correct. Okay, so you can make a complaint. Um, or you can appeal, which is obviously slightly different. So there we go. There we go. So when you've been for your medical assessment, again with any benefit, you'll receive an outcome, you'll receive a decision letter. If it's in your favour, great, but just check it with PIP. Sometimes I see clients and they've got 11 points and they're one point short on the 12. Look at it and identify has a descriptor been missed. Because if you have been awarded personal independence payment and you appeal, all of it can be taken away at appeal. It doesn't happen very often. And the DWP will tell you, well, we can take it away as well as give, 
Well, that's fine, okay? But it's important then that you check, and I would go to a welfare benefit specialist, just to double check and say, I think I should have got an extra point here. What do you think? You know, it's always good to get a second opinion. So you challenge, as I've said, with a mandatory reconsideration, and the Turn to Us website has a great section on mandatory reconsiderations as well. And then finally, if that doesn't work, as I discussed before, you can go to an appeal. Hopefully not. Hopefully all the preparation, and that's the key to PIP, and indeed any benefit, is prepare yourself. When you get that form, have a look at any guides that there are that can help you. It's free. All this information is absolutely free. And it's good information. Okay. Prepare by gathering evidence. Okay. Getting statements from, from people, if you can, to support what you're saying in your PIP form or indeed any benefit decision, any benefit claim. So if you plan and prepare for PIP when you send your claim form off and be for a medical assessment, hopefully, hopefully, it should be a success with all that planning and preparation. Now I can see all your eyes glazing over. So if there's any questions at all, please do ask me now. But if you would prefer to ask me later, as I say, I'll be over by the teas and coffees. Well, if that's it for now, as I say, please do come and see me if you've got any questions. It's been a pleasure. Thanks very much.